Hey guys, so my name is Anna Smallwood, um, and I'm a PhD graduate from Dr. Yu's lab from December of 2020, uh, and I'm going to basically prepare this little video for you to uh, kind of guide you on your journey of preparing a PhD candidacy exam, um, and I'll kind of break this down into three short parts. Um, one is how to study for the candidacy exam, general info about it, etc. Uh, two will be on preparing the written proposal, and I'll use mine as an example, and I'll kind of go through how I prepared mine. Um, and then part three is the final part, which is preparing the candidacy presentation, which is probably the most important part of your uh, candidacy exam. And I'll also use mine as an example here for you guys to kind of see um, what these would look like as a final product. So just some general information about the candidacy exam. Um, to continue into the PhD program in chemistry and chemical biology at RPI, uh, at the end of our second year, we have a candidacy exam, which would otherwise at other schools is known as like a qualifier. Um, and in our case, uh, we ask our students to present research, original research that they are interested in pursuing for the rest of their PhD. So that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have the project done. It is a proposal, but you have to have a very, very well thought out knowledgeable plan for executing this new and original research which will eventually culminate in your PhD and your thesis. Um, so basically when you go into this not only do you need to prepare written materials, uh, oral presentation materials, but you also need to study and it's a little overwhelming compared to a, a traditional written exam. Uh, because it's a very broad knowledge base that you could you could be asked about during your exam. So I guess one of the first things I like to tell people when they ask about candidacy is you need to, by the time you're taking your candidacy exam, you need to have read probably over 150 papers on your subject matter um, to give you an idea of what is the state of the art, like what's the state of knowledge currently in the field or like the... Uh, the niche that you're looking into for your research. <clears throat> um, you will actually probably get asked a lot of questions during your oral exam portion of the candidacy exam about the literature that you read and prepared and how you, uh, where you got this information from and maybe who the big names in your field are. You may also get theory questions, which I think is probably less common, um, but is something to be prepared for as well. So if you are planning on getting your PhD in a field that you are less familiar with, like say you're like me, where I did not do my undergraduate in polymer chemistry, I did it in biochemistry, so I had a learning curve that I had to meet to get um, the basic knowledge about polymer down before I moved into my candidacy exam. Um, and you can do that not only through the papers that you read, but also textbooks help a lot, YouTube helps a lot, um, even just talking to Dr. Yu is going to help you a lot with that basic knowledge. Uh, so just some things to kind of keep in mind going forward. <clears throat> so that being said, um, we'll go ahead and move into the written portion of the candidacy exam. Uh, like I said, I'll give mine as an example. Um, and I'm going to go through how I approach my uh, written proposal. And then I think everyone has their own method, but I found this to be particularly effective and I felt well prepared when I went into my exam. Um, some background information about the written proposal. I believe the department, so Dr. Donolfo, the department head, puts uh, a limit of, I think, seven to eight pages double-spaced, not including your references. Uh, and that sounds easy, but it's actually very difficult to put all the information you want to put in your proposal into that length. So um, just plan to aim for seven to eight pages. Um, and that includes things like your figures, etc., so there are a few different sections also that the rubric that you can get from Dr. Donolfo, and I believe he sends them out right around the time everyone will be um, doing their candidacy. So usually the second spring semester of your um, PhD program, um, where there will be, I'll kind of walk these, walk you through these. There will be a specific aim section, which is the first one. This will be about one page roughly. There will be a background and significance section, and this is where you're going to be citing a lot of those papers that you've read, especially the really like high profile or important ones. This will usually be about two pages. Your research plan is the bulk of your proposal, and this is broken down into certain subheadings as well. So there's rationale, methods, data analysis and interpretation, potential issues and alternative approaches, 
And then there's also a progress timeline that is tacked onto the end as well. So I'll go through each of these. Um, firstly, you don't need, need a cover page, but I put it just for my committee um, to see my title and all my information. And um, this was before COVID-19, so it was in person. So just a reminder of the date and time here too. Um, and all my information is here. Um, there's no, there's no like rubric or not rubric. Um, there's no word template for um, the candidacy proposal like there is for the thesis. Uh, so you can kind of do this yourself. I do know that they require it to be like size 12 font and single spaced, and then the length requirement is the only real requirement here, so you can format it how you'd like um, otherwise. So specific aims is basically going to talk about the big picture of your research and how it ties into the existing science, um, but also what it, uh, what new things it brings to the table. And I find that subheaders and uh, n like numerations or bullet points are really helpful in a candidacy exam, um, not only because they break up the look of the paper and it's not so overwhelming for your committee members, but it also is makes it really easy for you to form your presentation around it. So basically, I give a brief overview here. Um, of my pro or of my project and why it's important. I also have this nice little graphic here. It's not scientific at all. It's really just a Venn diagram that gives an overview of my project and what topics in science are involved in this project. These are really nice too, kind of to like ease the eyes on the paper, but also to give your committee and anyone else who's reading it like an added glance of okay, what what topics are we going to be talking about in this paper? Like I said, enumeration is really important. Um, I find it to be the best way to format things like this. <clears throat> so I included three specific aims for my candidacy project in chronological order, what I was assuming would be chronological order at the time, because it is a proposal. Um, and then also, like I said, this is specific aims, but I also have a, a short section on the significance of the work. Um, and again, this kind of deals with why, why you're doing it how it's original, and how it contributes to the already existing knowledge. So this should give a really nice, almost like an abstract, will give a nice overview of the proposal. Your background and significance, um, this is really kind of just a, like a short literature review. So this is going to, the, the format of this might change depending on what your topic is, um, but I just did it in prose format, um, like I would a literature review. So I start really broad at the top. Um, so for my project was on 3D printing. So I start with 3D printing as a whole and why it's important and what kind of, you know, what is it brought to the table for science and for manufacturing um, things that we might need for research. And I kind of zoom in on a particular type of 3D printing called stereolithography. And from then on, I go smaller and smaller and smaller until the very last paragraph or towards the end. I have um, a short paragraph that basically says, Combining everything that I just supported with this liter with all the literature that I've read, this is my plan, and that makes a very nice transition into your research plan. So, like I said, your um, background and significant single space should be about two pages, um, and it looks like I have cited like about twenty sources in here. I would say that's probably on the lower end. I would say somewhere between like twenty five and forty would be ideal. Um, so just keep that in mind. You don't need to do like hundreds or anything, but um, you definitely want to show that your your background um, research that you've done in different literature is sufficient. So as for the research plan, like I said, there's specific uh, subheaders that the rubric that Dr. Donolfo provides um, that it requires, uh, rationale being one of them. The ones that are in italics here that are in the center of the page are the required subheaders. And then the ones that kind of start off the paragraphs are what I've added. Like I said, I really like subheading and it really helps to uh, guide the paper to where it's going. Um, one thing I'd like to say about uh, methods under research plan, because rationale kind of, if you, if you formatted your uh, proposal the same way that I did, you should have rationale at the beginning in your specific aims. Um, but this might be a little bit more specific for this paragraph, but it should still be pretty short. Um, as for methods, this is where you're going to, if you have any, put preliminary data. And you will most likely have preliminary data in Dr. Yu's lab because that's generally how we operate. Um, you might have a lot. You might have a little. Um, just keep in mind that there's probably not going to be much more room for more than two to three tables and figures, which is what I have here. You can see how much room that takes up. And I've actually like organize these in a way to keep as much text space as I can because I found that 
um, the seven to eight pages fills up really quickly. So if you are going to be putting preliminary data in your proposal, make sure it's very meaningful. Um, and it is, I guess, it contributes to your proposal uh, especially well out of all your data because you really don't have room to put everything to try to convince your committee, you know, this is what I'm doing. So um, definitely put the figures that you think are most important and you can talk to Dr. Yu about that too and he'll have some ideas as to what, what might be best to show. So for me in my original proposal, I showed um, some GPC curves uh, and then a GPC analysis on the right. But then I also had a kind of a comparative uh, line plot here that is taken. For, I did some calculations uh, from the GPC data, and this kind of was me showing oh, molecular weight control and how can I how can I influence it. So um, definitely keep that in mind. You can put preliminary data in, but you do not need to fill your proposal with it, and you actually shouldn't. You should be mostly proposing. Um, so again, I have my subheaders of like the projects that I was planning on working on. Like I said, the research plan is going to be um, the bulk of your proposal, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then, of course, once you propose the actual experiments you want to do, we get down to data analysis and interpretation. So this is, if you're using any particular like equations or laws, um, you want to include them here. But at the same time, uh, if you are using any particular instrumentation, um, you want to put that here as well. So you can kind of format this how you feel is necessary depending on the direction of your project. Mine was very instrumental, so I used a lot of G I was planning on using a lot of GPC, ATR, FTIR, um, and then also tensile testing. Um, and then I also have like a short section on bioconjugation. And uh, you can see that these aren't super detailed, um, but you want to basically give an idea of why am I using this method? What's it going to contribute to my project and what am I going to find out from it? So definitely just keep that in mind. Um, this section, this one really makes you think, uh, which is probably why they require it for the proposal, um, potential issues and alternative approaches. So you can come up with a few issues. I came up with four um, and I, I picked four that were pretty like broad issues, so things that would be common to run into during experimenting, but also could have a large effect on the progress of my project. Um, so I picked four of them. Um, so I did undesirable properties, photo initiator incompatibility, <clears throat> insufficient scaffold cross-linking, and then not only do I list them, but I also give a short explanation and say like, oh, you know, this could happen. If it, if it does happen, uh, here's what we can do to um, basically remedy this situation. And it's to, to show your committee that, you know, you recognize that this probably no scientific proposal is going to be straightforward. Um, it's probably going to take a lot of twists and turns, and you want to show that you understand that. Um, and, of course, you see that these don't need to be crazy detailed, but you need to give just a couple sentences saying, you know, this is what I can do to fix this uh, if this does happen. So your final part is your progress timeline. This is this is very straightforward. Um, however many years you're planning to take to finish your PhD in Dr. Yu's lab, it's somewhere between four and five years. Uh, so I erred on the side of four years, which was very hopeful because um, I, I ended up leaving at four and a half years, so I was on track. But um, you'll probably do something similar between four and five years. Um, and basically, all you need to do is list the different years of your PhD and what you plan on completing in each year. And this shows your committee that you have a timeline and you know exactly when you would like to accomplish these things. Um, you could break it down by semester, too, but I, I don't think that's necessary. You probably can just do a year, and that will be fine. Um, last section is references. Obviously, references are not included in your page count. So don't worry about if you have 50 references and it takes up three pages. It's not a big deal. Um, these are going to be in American Chemical Society format, or ACS. Um, that's important to get used to now during your candidacy, uh, because when you get to your thesis, OGE, or the Office of Graduate Education, is going to correct each and every one of your references if they are not in the proper format. So um, this is a really good practice for formatting. And there are a few different reference managers that you can use um, to help with this. Mendeley is free online, and that's my personal favorite. You can also use Zotero um, or EndNote. I know EndNote costs money, but I believe Dr. Yu has like a, a, a code for it through the university or something. But 
Um, I used Mendeley for my candidacy and my um, my defense, and I found it to be really straightforward, but it's totally up to you and what your preferences are. Um, and you can see I have a total of 22. Looking back, I probably would have put more, closer to like 35, 40. Um, but this, this was sufficient at the time. Um, and you just want to list these in the order that they appear in your proposal, which according to ACS, um, ACS formatting. You'll also see that when you do reference them in your paper through ACS, they're used as a subscript, like you can see here. So just keep that in mind, and they're always in order. And you can have two or more references for one sentence or one statement. Uh, there is an official ACS guide online that you can access. I believe it's a PDF, and it's, it's online for free. That's the one you want to use. Don't go by any university's um, guide because there's the usually mistakes in them. I would recommend using the official one. So um, the way I did this is I wrote my proposal over the course of two to three months, and I really, really like focused on the proposal and um, got my preliminary results over the course of the year before I um, proposed this. Uh, but I usually the proposal is due before your presentation. So what I ended up doing is really fine-tuning my proposal uh, and then using it kind of as an outline, a really detailed outline, to do my presentation. And I found that worked best for me, and that's how I did my defense as well. So we'll move into the presentation. Um, and of course, this is my presentation that I presented in early 2018 for my candidacy exam. Um, I won't go through the whole thing for you, but um, I can give you an idea of kind of what this looks like. Um, this is our old template, so this this template is not available, and our, our group now does, instead of this um, like square type of format, we have the 16 by 9, which looks a lot nicer. Um, and you can actually access those in our, our group's box. Um, so don't pay attention to the format or anything. But <clears throat> basically, um, I guess the candidacy presentations are usually anywhere between like 30 to 45 minutes, and I would aim for 45 minutes. And a good rule of thumb for presentations is one slide per minute. So for me, you can see that I have about 44 slides. Um, I, th I can't remember how long mine was, to be honest, because it ends at slide 34. I think my presentation was about 40 minutes long. Um, and then everything past that is my, my backup slides. Um, but yeah, so you'll, you'll kind of see some similarities between this and my proposal. Um, for the presentation, because it is a, a longer presentation, I generally do the title slide and I'll do an overview, like a brief outline. I generally don't recommend this for shorter presentations, like 15 to 20 minutes, but because this is a longer one, I think this gives a nice overview for the committee. Um, as you can see, I have my little, um, my non-scientific, just eye-pleasing uh, graphic here that I put in my first, uh, my first slide. And of course, a lot of these phrases are taken from my proposal. Um, and note that also I prefer to use as little text on the slides as possible, um, just because it's, it's so much nicer to sit through a presentation that's not all text. Um, but in the slides where you have to use them, um, definitely use them. So like, for example, specific aims. Um, what I like to do, I'll, num I'll number them out, and then I will put in red or bold the important parts or things that I want people to take away. Um, so for the candidacy presentation, you usually start with a background. So this will be like a lot of the literature um, that you read and that you had in your proposal. So I'd like to just pause here and point out, like I said before, you're probably going to get a lot of questions uh, or a few questions, at least from your committee, about the literature that you read before you made this proposal. Um, and I would highly recommend at the bottom right of your slides to include the sources of anything that you're showing on the slide because it makes things easier for the committee because sometimes they can recognize a paper or recognize a name and they can say, oh, like, I know that. That's that's legitimate. Like, this makes sense. Um, but it also serves as a reminder to you if you do get a question um, from your committee member about one of these sources that you might have on your slide. And you'll see throughout my background that I have those sources listed. If I take like images, for example, like of this printer, that was taken just from Formlabs, the website, so I just make a little note down here. But for example, here we have an ACS citation of where I got this information from. So once you get through your background and significance, which hopefully should be a lot of really nice like schematics and diagrams, 
you can get into your proposed methods and proposed research plan, which will be the second part. And again, this is where you are going to put your preliminary data. And so I actually have a lot more preliminary data in my presentation than I did in my proposal because I have a lot more time to talk about it. So instead of just my GPC analysis, I have my FTIR, I had some mass spec. Um, and you can see I kind of put these divider slides in here where I would highlight what I was currently about to talk about. So for in the first section, I talked about the oligomers. And the next one, I talk about chain transfer catalysis, which is here. Of course, this is cited heavily down here. Um, this is kind of the proposed mechanism that I was using in my preliminary results. Again, more preliminary results showing what I did. You can kind of mix it all up to form a really nice story. You don't have to show, oh, these are my results, and then be like, here's the literature. Um, the only part that I would recommend doing that in is the, the background, because it's, it's going to be everyone else's literature, not yours. Um, but for the, the proposed methods, you can form it into a nice story to, so it kind of flows to your, can, your uh, committee and they know, they know what you're talking about. And then, of course, my final section is um, what I'm planning on using, the materials I'm planning on using, and where I'm going to get them from. So for us, these were commercially available, so I listed the source and the price. And then I have a proposal here for flexibility increase using a specific molecule, more preliminary results with that molecule. And then these are some instrumental methods, some instrumental results. And this was my final proposal for bioconjugation, which unfortunately I didn't get the chance to finish before I left. Um, and then I, I really just kind of condensed my data analysis and interpretation plans down into one slide because you don't really need to expand it much more than that. Same with potential issues and then timeline. So you really want to focus on what preliminary results do you have and what does that lead into for the next portion of your, um, of your PhD or your program given you pass your candidacy. So of course we have our acknowledgement slide, which is always important. Um, I do want to point out the necessity of backup slides. So for example, a GPC calibration curve. This wouldn't be something you would really want to show in a presentation. It's kind of boring. Um, your committee members are going to be like, okay, great, GPC calibration. But if they ask a question about it, which they might, um, you have it in your backup slides. So you can easily uh, navigate to it and say, oh, this is the calibration curve, and then answer the question. Um, I kind of did the same. That's another calibration curve. Same thing here. You can also put alternative figures, like figures you've already shown, but in a different format in the backup slides. If someone's unclear on something, that's a good idea. This was a figure I showed in my proposal, um, but decided to not show in my preliminary results because it didn't fit my story quite as well as what I was trying to show in the, in the presentation. Got some math. Of course, that's important if anyone has a question about that. Um, <clears throat> some chemical um, mechanisms for different additives that I was putting in. Um, microscopy images more mechanisms. Yep, so that's basically um, what I would do for backup slides. And having a lot of backup, backup slides is always a good thing. I think I have like 10, could even add more than that. Um, but yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. I would never go into a presentation with no backup slides. Definitely try to think ahead of time. What questions do you, th do you think you're going to get asked? And not only is that a good study tool, but it'll help you build those backup slides as well. So um, that's just a brief overview of how to prepare a PhD candidacy exam. Um, I will put, I showed you the original of my uh, proposal and my presentation. And if you have any questions about them, you can obviously speak to Dr. Yu. But if you want to reach out to me about anything you saw, you can email me at uh, this email, which is my permanent email and will not change um, even though I've graduated. So I'm also going to do a short video on um, how to prepare a PhD defense and thesis. So I will end this one here and then um, we'll get into that one.